This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. Violent crime, political unrest, financial instability. Everything points to an impending crisis, a crisis like no other. Tune in to World's Last Chance Radio to learn how you can spiritually prepare for what lies ahead. WLC Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's imminent return. Greetings and welcome to WLC Radio. I'm your host, Miles Roby. And I'm Dave Wright, and thank you for joining us. I'm really excited about the programme that we've got planned for you today. It's about an emotion we've all experienced at one time or another, and that's fear. Well, there are actually two ways people respond to fear, to be honest. Uh, Dave's got some exciting new thoughts about the gift of fear that he's going to be sharing with us. Before we get into all of that, I want to explain for the benefit of those joining us for the very first time that you'll be hearing us use some words that may be new to you. At WLC, we always use the personal name of the Heavenly Father, which is Yahweh or Yah. The name of the Son is Yahushua. The Father's name is actually used throughout Scripture. It's just been covered up in our modern translations by having the generic titles of Lord or God substituted instead. And, you know, that is a real shame because the Mm. name of Yahweh itself is a powerful promise. It is. Yahweh comes from the verb of being Haya. You can find that word throughout Genesis 1. In our modern Bibles, it's translated as, let there be light, and there was light. But in the original Hebrew, it was simply, light be, light was. It's perfectly fitting that the self-existent one who was and is and is to come would take for his name all the verbs of being. And what this teaches us is that Yah's name, when said in combination with your need, becomes a powerful promise that you can claim. You're in danger and need protection? Call on his name. Be protected and you are protected. Remember that his name plus your need equals a powerful promise to claim by faith. That's truly what it means to call upon the name of the Lord, to call upon Yahweh. So, Fear. We we generally tend to view fear as a bad thing, but it can actually be a good thing. It lets you know when to be cautious. Yes, yes, you're right. Now, when I was in university, I knew a man that worked as a guard in a maximum security prison, as we call it. Apparently, there was a prisoner there that had no sense of pain. At first glance, you might think, oh, cool, never get hurt again. But lacking that sense of pain was actually very dangerous. He might get stabbed by another prisoner, he might even get a life-threatening injury, and he wouldn't know the danger because it wouldn't hurt. He could only tell by looking if something were really wrong. And that's the purpose of fear. It lets us know when we're in danger so that we can do something about it. Mm, It reminds me of something that my father told me uh, after one of my... um youthful oh, um, what, indiscretions perhaps <laughs> well, no, uh, let's just say adventures thank you very much indeed <laughs> so what did he say then well he said courage isn't a lack of fear it's the wisdom to recognize danger and then act responsibly the village idiot can appear very brave because he's too stupid to be afraid of danger oh ouch mm, yeah he had a way with words my dad uh, But he got his point across, he really did. And, of course, you still remember it. A very wise man, your father, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Well, based on stories my mum tells, of course, and I tend to think his wisdom came from life experience rather than any um, innate good judgment he was born with. (laughs) So you could say that he he learned to fear and this increased his wisdom. Well, yeah, you, you, you could say that, to be fair, to be honest, yeah. Earlier, you referred to fear as a gift, the gift of fear. Now, I'd really like to enlarge on that because fear really is a gift. So let's start by reading Isaiah chapter 59. No, before, just hold on a second, because yeah. um, I called it the gift of fear 
because that's what you'd said it was. But what do you do with 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7? Mm. Here, let me read it. It says, For Yah hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Ah, okay. Well, let's look at that then. Now, the word that's translated into English as fear comes from the Greek word delia. Quoting Strong's expanded dictionary, this is defined as timidity. The word denotes cowardice, unmanliness, and timidity. So Paul's right. Yah has not given us a spirit of cowardice, unmanliness, and timidity. So I take it that's not the word you're talking about. No, exactly. A completely different word, completely right. different language. The okay. fear we're going to be talking about today comes from the Hebrew word yore. Here, would you just read what Strong's Expanded Dictionary has to say? Yeah. Just have a look at it there. It's right down the bottom of the page there. Yore means to be afraid, stand in awe, fear. Basically, this verb connotes the psychological reaction of fear. Yore may indicate being afraid of something or someone. This is not simple fear, but reverence, whereby an individual recognises the power and position of the individual revered and renders him proper respect. In this sense, the word may imply submission to a proper ethical relationship to Yah. Yore can also be used absolutely with no direct object, meaning to be afraid. That's very interesting indeed, Dave. So you can see it's a completely different word. Connotations tend to get lost in translation. So now let's turn to Isaiah chapter 59 and let's read verses 19 to 21. Now listen for the word fear as you read it. Okay, so it says, So shall they fear the name of Yahweh from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of Yahweh will lift up a standard against him. The Redeemer will come to Zion, and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says Yahweh, As for me, says Yahweh, this is my covenant with them. My spirit who is upon you, and my words which I have put in your mouth, shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says Yahweh, from this time and forevermore. Fear has two purposes, and both are for our benefit. The first is to reveal what's in the heart. The second is to produce and grow faith. Here at WLC, we talk about the end of the world quite a bit. We're convicted that Yahushua is coming soon. We're excited about that, so that's often our focus. In focusing on that, one topic we discuss a lot is the prophecies, especially of Daniel and Revelation. Now, when we say end of the world, time of trouble, seven last plagues, what mental image do most people get? Oh, well, that's easy. It's chaos and strife, political upheaval, turmoil, anarchy, famine, pestilence, suffering, death, all those. Rather a dark future, yeah. Yes. And when you think about this, what's your gut-level reaction? What are you actually feeling? Well, the most thing that I would feel is fear. You know, don't don't want to think about it, just want to escape from it. Sure, you know? uh, and that, of course, is a natural reaction to feeling fear. Now, yeah. depending on what is in the heart, the response will be different. Yahweh allows dangers to come so that we can see what is in our hearts. And this is an important point. We need to know what's in our hearts. How else can we be ready unless we know what's in the hidden heart? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take a look, actually, at Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3, verses 11 to 14. So if you could bring that to us, Miles, what does yeah, it sure. say? Well, it says, Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Yahweh. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of Yahweh is near in the valley of decision. This applies now. Today there are three groups in the world, a small group of those who are Yah's. 
a larger group of those who are Satan's, and a really huge assembly of those who haven't yet made their final decision. Well, I've noticed that the first two groups are getting larger, while the third group is steadily decreasing. Sure, people are making their choice. They're being solidified, if you will. They're being hardened into whichever side they've chosen. Yeah, it's true. You can see it in how they treat others. And you can see it in their response to truth. In the near future, once everyone has made his or her decision, probation will close and that's it. Mm -hmm. The seven last plagues will be poured out on those who've joined with Satan in his rebellion and it's all over. Now, though, people are still making their decision. And one method Yah uses to reveal what's in the individual heart is fear. But how? Because I'm not seeing how fear can be used in, in such a way. Well, it's the person's reaction to fear that reveals what's in their heart. I'm still not sure. What, what do you mean by that? Well, how a person reacts to fear reveals to himself what's in his heart, whether right. that is trust or cowardice. cowardice. Right, OK. For example, let's take the seed of the serpent. To a man who clings to known sin, to a woman who doesn't want to surrender her will to Yahweh, Fear sets off a chain reaction. First, you've got panic. That's the emotional gut-level response to danger. You panic. And we all know with an emotional response like panic, logic flies out of the window. You know, you quit thinking, you just start reacting, don't you? Yeah, exactly. And, of course, that's why this reveals the hidden heart. In someone who wants to continue sinning, he doesn't want to give up that cherished sin, she doesn't want to surrender and obey... Panic then becomes a reason to compromise. And when you compromise on truth, you're going to surrender or give up your principles, aren't you? You're not going to stand firm on the word of Yah alone. If you compromise, the two are mutually exclusive, if you will. Yes, they are. And that leads to the next link in this chain reaction. Compromise will produce sin. When you compromise your principles, sin will lose its sinfulness in your own mind. Of course, you know, none of us like cognitive dissonance and that tension we feel uh, when our beliefs and wants contradict themselves. It makes us uncomfortable. So what happens? People end up choosing to modify their beliefs or behaviour in order to reduce that tension. Obviously, that's something Yah's true-hearted people will never do, of course. No, but lots of people do. This mm. compromise then leads to sin, and that's why Satan tries so hard to get people to give in. It's why he arranges circumstances, the loss of a job, the fear of ridicule, whatever the reason. He arranges it to try and compel people to compromise, because he knows that once they've adjusted their beliefs because it's more convenient to give in, they will sin. Compromise always brings sin. And then sin produces evil without guilt. They've already adjusted what they know to be right in order to have temporal ease, so their consciences become hardened. I can see that, and that's exactly what Paul warned about in First Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Just give me a second to just quickly look oh, sure, yeah. this up. Um, here it is. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. This is the unpardonable sin. It's the sin against the spirit of Yah, because once you harden your heart enough, you can't even feel those gentle nudges to choose the right anymore. This is what fear does to the unsanctified heart. The revelation of that fear is to lead us in repentance to the Father. If, when you're facing the threat of losing your job because of your stance on the Sabbath, when you're maybe facing the loss of friendship because of your beliefs, if your first reaction is to compromise rather than stand firm for Yah, then that is a revelation of what's in your heart. It says your job, your friends, your reputation, they're all more important than obeying Yah and doing his will. Mm. And if that's the case, we need to know that about ourselves, don't we? Mm. Listen, we're going to take a short break. And when we return, I'd like to hear about fear and how it affects those who are loyal to Yah. We'll be right back. Mm. 
Most Christians today have been taught that the law of Yahweh was nailed to the cross. This, in turn, becomes the justification for breaking the fourth commandment, no longer observing Yahweh's feasts, eating unclean meats, embracing pagan holidays, and a whole host of other practices forbidden in scripture. Certainly something was nailed to the cross, but it wasn't the divine law. All governments rest on the rule of law. They have to, or there would be chaos, and the government of heaven is no different. To understand precisely what was, and what was not nailed to the cross, visit our website on worldslastchance.com. Click on the WLC radio icon. Scroll down to the episode entitled, What Was Really Nailed to the Cross? Learn the truth. It may surprise you, but it's beautiful and, what's more, consistent with the rest of Scripture. Once again, look for the episode entitled, What Was Really Nailed to the Cross? You could also listen to it on YouTube. For anyone who's just tuning in, we've been talking today about the gift of fear, how Yahuwah uses it to reveal what is in the heart. And for those whose hearts are not right with Yah, their reaction is to panic and compromise. Compromise of your beliefs, of your values and principles invariably leads to active sin. Indulged sin then produces evil in the heart without guilt. Which ultimately will eventually turn it into the unpardonable sin. So if that's how those who are lost respond to fear, how do Yah's people respond then? Well, they turn to him. Sure, right. they may be afraid, they may even panic, but in the midst of that fear and panic, they turn to Yah for deliverance. So could you turn now to Psalm 56 and start reading for us at verse 1? Sure. This Psalm 56 provides a perfect illustration of how the righteous respond to fear. Be merciful to me, O Yah, for man would swallow me up. Fighting all day he oppresses me. My enemies would hound me all day, for there are many who fight against me, O Most High. That's the danger. That's the bad situation yeah. therein. Now, read the next two verses. Let's just see what their instinctual reaction to fear is. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. In Yah, I will praise his word. In Yah, I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? This is the response of the person whose heart is right with Yah. When you're afraid, when it seems like your life is falling down around your ears and you're starting to panic, mm. one sure way to turn that panic into trust rather than compromise is to remind yourself of how the Father has helped others like you in the past. Yep, like the Gospel hymn says, what he's done for others, he'll do for you. Yes, and in fact the next line says, with arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It's no secret what God can do. So yeah, focusing on his past mercies, the way he's blessed you and others in the past will inspire confidence that he'll do the same for you. What he's done for others, he will do for you. I remember reading a story once that's really stuck with me. Uh, these two young men were driving somewhere. I, I don't remember where, to be honest, but they got stuck in traffic somehow. Lots of vehicles, gridlocks, you know. Uh, they weren't going anywhere. Yeah. So... You know what happens? They're, they're feeling under stress. They're not going to make their appointment in time. The blood pressures start to rise. Oh, yeah, been there, done that. <laughs> not a good feeling. No, not at all. Well, stuck in traffic ahead of them was a truck that was loaded down. It looked like the people were moving or something. It was packed. It was packed. As the morning hours wore away, people in the long line of cars got more and more impatient. The young men got out of their car. They were hot, bored, hungry, but there weren't any stores around and they hadn't anticipated getting stuck on the freeway for hours on end. Now, about this time, a couple climbed out of the truck ahead of them. The man dug around in the back of the truck and pulled out a camp stove. The woman opened a cooler. They started chatting with the young men and ended up inviting them to join them for lunch. <laughs> that was very nice of them. Well, the thing the guys noticed was how happy the couple seemed. While the husband chatted with the men, the wife fixed lunch whilst humming happily. As they were eating lunch, 
come to find out the couple were homeless. See, Hurricane Katrina had just hit New Orleans in the United States a few days before, and they'd lost everything. All they owned was in the back of their truck. Wow. Okay, so this would have been, what, 2004, 2005? Well, yeah, 2005, actually. Uh, It was bad. I mean, over 1,800 people lost their lives. Mm. A lot of homes were destroyed. It still ranks as the costliest natural disaster in U.S. history. This couple were headed north to stay with their daughter whilst they tried to get back on their feet. And you said she'd been singing. Yeah, well, what she was singing goes along with what you've been saying. She was humming the old gospel song, His Eye is on the Sparrow. And the first goes, Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. And then the chorus goes on. I sing because I'm happy, I sing because I'm free, for his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. (laughs) And this was the song that this woman was humming while preparing lunch by the Mm. side of the road. Yeah, yeah. And when I read the story, you know, the thought that flashed through my mind was she's singing to strengthen her faith. She's singing to remind herself that Yah is still in control. It was a beautiful demonstration of faith. Yeah, that's that's wonderful in those circumstances as well. And I think you're right. That's exactly what she was doing. She was strengthening her faith and confidence in Yah by reminding herself of his goodness and omnipotent strength. And this is what the righteous do when faced with overwhelming difficulties, with situations that they don't know how to resolve. And do you know what, Miles? We all need to learn how to react this way. Yeah, yeah. And we need it to be a reaction. Actions are thought out. Reactions aren't thought out. You know, they're just instantaneous responses. And that's why it shows what's in the heart. Yes. Let's just take a few minutes and look at what we know we're going to be facing in the days ahead. Now, in a couple of earlier programmes, we talked about there being two phases to divine wrath. There's the first stage. Yes, it's going to be bad. But these judgments are still mingled with mercy. Yeah, they're designed to wake people up. Yeah, exactly. To show them what's in their hearts. Then we've got the second phase of divine wrath. This is the punishment phase of divine wrath. So none of Yah's people will be affected by the seven last plagues. Yeah. Let's take a quick look at some of the events under the first and second phases of divine wrath. We won't go through all of them, but I want to look at some of them. So could you firstly read Revelation chapter 8, verse 7? Now, this is the first trumpet, or the event that opens the first phase of divine wrath. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. And a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. We're talking about catastrophic events here. Yeah. With a third of the trees destroyed and all the green grass, what's going to be the fallout effect from this event? Well, one would think famine. It's going to destroy the world's food supply. And even though you can plant again, what do you do for food while the next crop is growing? Mm. The world's food reserves are already dangerously low. So yes, famine is going to be the result of this event. Now let's look at the two different ways a person can respond. We can assume each way has an element of panic. Death by starvation is an ugly way too as well. I can imagine there'll be looting, violence as people fight over the last food reserves. Yes, and that's one panicked response. But mm. but what's the other? For a person who believes in Yah, what's he likely to do? How, how will she respond? Well, I'd imagine by thinking of times Yah has delivered people from starvation in the past. Right, you know? yes. Well, there's Elijah, isn't there, by the brook Cherith. Yah sent ravens to feed him. Then once the brook dried up, Yah sent him to a poor, starving widow in the village of Zarephath, where another miracle sustained him, the widow, and her son for the rest of the years of no rain. And it's, it's more than another miracle, isn't it? Yah made sure the widow's well didn't run dry, and he supplied them with enough flour and oil to feed them each day, and those miracles continued throughout the famine. Yeah, and that's a story I'd want to remember when facing famine too. All right then, what's next? Could you read the next trumpet, please? Mm -hmm. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. 
and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Now this sounds a lot like the second plague, where the angel pours out his bowl on the sea and turns it to blood and all the sea life dies. But unlike the seven last plagues, the first phase of divine judgment is still mingled with mercy. It's designed to wake people up so they can turn to Yah and be saved. With the famine under the first trumpet, the second trumpet impacts the sea, killing a lot of sea life that could have been used for food and disrupting global shipping. Then the third trumpet sounds. Uh, and it says, Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. And many men died from the water because it was made bitter. So now we've got water shortages. What happens when you combine famine with shortages of drinkable water? People start to get sick, of course. And then you start to run out of medicine. And then more people get sick and then more people start to die. All right. So disease. A person whose heart is right with Yah will strengthen his faith by remembering all the instances in Scripture where people were healed. Then, of course, the New Testament, it's full of such stories. Yeah, the healing of the ten lepers in Luke 17, where Yahushua told the one who returned to thank him, Arise, go your way, your faith has made you well. Mm. You can see how those words claimed by faith would really inspire confidence in someone who is sick in the days ahead. And that's exactly the point of the trumpets, to reveal to the individual what's in the heart. Is he going to trust in Yah's ability to heal just as he did in ancient times? Or in order to buy medicine, will he compromise his beliefs and consent to receive the mark of the beast? One person trusts in Yah, the other doesn't. This is what fear is designed to reveal while we still have time to repent. Let's read that passage in Isaiah 59 once more. It's uh, Isaiah 59. Just read verse 19. Notice what happens when someone fears the name of Yahweh. Go ahead, Miles. So shall they fear the name of Yahweh from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of Yahweh will lift up a standard against him. Those who fear Yahweh in the sense of reverencing him, those recognize his power and position and give him the proper respect, in turn receive a tremendous blessing. What does the spirit of Yahweh do for him? Uh, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of Yahweh will lift up a standard against him. This is the believer's defense. When we're in danger and feeling panicked, when we choose to trust in Yah anyway, based on evidence of previous deliverances, then our faith is inspired to claim the promises. This, in turn, sets a chain of events into motion. As we claim the promises, the spirit of Yah lifts up a standard against the enemy for us, and in our own lives, we begin to see and experience miracles for ourselves. These aren't stories that happened to others long ago. These are our experiences. Yes, experiencing your own miracles is a feeling like no other. You feel grateful. You can't help but feel grateful. Hmm. The gratitude you feel increases your love. And your love, in turn, inspires still more faith, and so the cycle continues. This is why Yah allows bad things to happen to good people. It's not so they'll be destroyed, it's so their faith and confidence in him and his love for them will grow. And as their faith grows, their gratitude and love grow, which only increases their faith. It's an incredibly beautiful cycle of transforming grace. That's powerful. And when you explain it that way, it really sheds light on 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 18. I've got it here. Let's quickly read it for you. It says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of Yah in Christ Yahushua for you. There's another very practical aspect of giving thanks in all circumstances. When you're grateful, you see possibilities. When you're griping and complaining, it only increases your fear and you miss out on the many opportunities that surround you. Absolutely. And it reminds me of the story Corrie Ten Boom used to tell. During World War II, she and her sister Betsy were put into a concentration camp. Now, the barracks they were assigned was crawling with fleas. Ooh. Corrie was really upset. I mean, this was too much. Now, 
interestingly enough, just that morning, the sisters had read this very same passage in First Thessalonians. With Corrie so upset by the fleas, Betsy reminded her that they were to give thanks in all circumstances. So they began. Betsy prayed first. Thank you, Father, that we've been assigned to the same barracks. Thank you that we still have our Bible. Thank you for the fleas. <laughs> for the fleas? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know, that was Corrie's response when Betsy said that. <laughs> but Betsy said, look, it doesn't say to give thanks in pleasant circumstances, does it? It says to give thanks in all circumstances. And fleas are part of this place where Yah has put us. Wow, that does take faith. Doesn't it? But you know what? The sisters decided to be thankful for the fleas by faith. And that's the, the only way you can be thankful for fleas. And you know what they discovered? What? Not a single guard ever entered their barracks. It was known to be flea infested, and every last guard refused to step foot in the place. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Fear really is a gift, folks. It reveals what's in the heart, and if what's in the heart is love and reverence for Yah, then his spirit will raise up a standard against the enemy for us. We really don't need to be afraid. We just need to trust. Yeah, we do. Stay tuned. Up next... It's our Daily Mailbag. You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ at 93.30 kilohertz on the 31 metre band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. A popular teaching in Christianity is the idea that the divine law was nailed to the cross with Yahushua. This is interpreted to mean that the divine law no longer needs to be kept. And truthfully, something was nailed to the cross, but it wasn't the Ten Commandments. WLC invites you to do a careful study of Colossians 2. Learn the truth of what was nailed to the cross, what was not, and the significance for Christians today. Go to worldslastchance.com and read What Was Nailed to the Cross? An Examination of Colossians 2. Again, that's What Was Nailed to the Cross on worldslastchance.com because what you don't know can hurt you. Question from our daily mailbag comes from Lago Fonseca in Colombia, Brazil. Now, he writes, What is your opinion on Christians seeing a psychiatrist or psychologist? Is it biblical or does it show lack of faith? Well, hello to you and thanks for the chance to answer this particular mm. question. In many countries, there's a certain social stigma attached to mental health issues and there really shouldn't be. Yeah, well, before you go on, actually, let's just clarify the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist. Yes, that's a good idea. Well, Miles, it sounds like you might have a quick and easy explanation for us. <laughs> well, I'd say it's the difference between biological versus behavioural. All right, so psychiatrists are medical doctors. They went to medical school and focus on treatment of mental, emotional, sometimes even behavioural disorders. The treatment often involves certain drugs. Psychologists, on the other hand, may have their doctorate, but it would be a PhD degree rather than a medical degree. They focus on the mental and emotional processes that influence a person's behaviour or decisions. Yeah, yeah, yeah well put. Well, when a person has a mental health issue, psychiatrists and psychologists often work together. The psychiatrist using various drugs applicable to the disorder and the psychologist using counselling and talk therapy. What do you think of this idea amongst Christians then that there's no such thing as mental illness? That's all due to, I don't know, personal sin, you know, a lack of faith, maybe a spiritual attack. See, they, they claim all you need to do is pray and you'll be healed. And then, of course, if you're not, it's your own fault because it's a faith issue. You you lack faith, right? Yeah, yeah. See, that's the basic message. But what are your thoughts on that one, Dave? Well, that's an oversimplification of a complicated issue. And mm. we aren't helping anyone by binding a burden of guilt on someone who's already struggling. 
Yeah. Isaiah chapter 42 describes the Saviour's mission of mercy by saying, A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. Meaning, Yahushua's mission was to encourage and uplift, not kick you when you're down. Yeah, that's a good point. I see, I remember one university professor saying that mental illness didn't exist in the sense of having a cold or the flu. However, the disorders we call mental illnesses could nine times out of ten be traced to the brain's reaction to unremitting stress or what he called complexity. When there's no relief, no reprieve from depression or extreme stress or a confusing admixture of the two, there's going to be a blowout, a reaction to that. And that's what appears as the various disorders we call mental illness. Yeah, and that's certainly a factor. And as we get closer and closer to the end, life is getting harder. The demands and pressures of modern life, are, do you know they're much worse today than they were, say, 200 years ago? Oh, yeah, absolutely. In such instances, a psychologist can help someone develop healthy coping mechanisms. If there's been any level of abuse in childhood, a psychologist can also help a person deal with those issues in a, in a healthy and, and healing way. And what about psychiatry, if it's all stress or behaviour-based, you know? Well, no, I didn't say that. In fact, th there's a very good reason to never condemn anyone who needs to see a psychiatrist, and that is the very real possibility that there may be chemical imbalances going on in the brain. Now, I'm all for natural remedies being the best approach to take, but there are certain things that need more intervention, if you like. If your brain has a chemical imbalance, you're probably not going to be able to fix the problem just by adding more kale or spinach to your diet. Or Brussels sprouts. <laughs> <laughs> and beets. Yes, certainly, yeah, that won't actually help either. Dr. Eric Johnson uh, is a Christian and author of a book called Foundations for Soul Care, a Christian Psychology Proposal. He has a unique way of looking at this issue. Now, he explains that, quote, the whole body can be affected by human fallenness, unquote. That really makes sense, to be honest. We're, we're fallen. It's been thousands of years since the human race had access to the tree of life. So it makes sense that there could be any number of issues arising out of that. So he's saying it's a result of the sin condition, not the faith condition? Well, I've pulled up a quote here, actually. It's just okay. there for you. I'd like you to read it. It's from an interview he gave in the Christian Post. There's reason to believe that the human brain can also be impacted by human fallenness and that things can go wrong at the genetic level, at the embryological level during development in utero, as well as through the rest of the lifespan. This right here is why we should never judge someone else. We're all sinners in need of a saviour. There's nothing inherently sinful about seeking medical help or help from a psychologist or counsellor. Now, a Christian may very well feel more comfortable working with a psychologist who's also a Christian simply because our worldviews are more similar. But even Yahushua acknowledged the need for doctors when a person is sick when he said, those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick. A godly physician can be a real blessing. With my wife's last pregnancy, there were some issues. Uh, we were blessed to have a doctor who was a committed Christian. I remember one appointment in particular after an emergency trip to the doctor's office. He came in and prayed with us. And, you know, that, that meant a lot to both of us. It yeah. really did. Yes, I'm sure it did. And remember, of course, Yahushua is the great physician. When he went around and healed people, he was healing legitimate physical and mental maladies. He didn't mm. just say, give up that secret sin you've been hiding from everyone and go yeah. pray some more and you'll be fine. Mental illness should not be viewed as a character flaw, a breakdown of the spiritual life. We're not called to judge that way. That's breaking a bruised reed, isn't it? Yeah, it really is, absolutely. Uh, it's not a weakness in the Christian's character. It's likely due to an underlying medical cause. It could be something as simple to treat as a brain chemical imbalance that will get better by supplementing the brain's natural chemistry with the right medication. And it could be down to a brain injury, even. Absolutely, or any other number of causes. Our role is to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're to encourage them and strengthen them in their faith, not set ourselves up as judge and jury. We can safely leave that up to Yahweh, who reads the heart. 
Absolutely. Okay, so I'm just clock watching here at the moment. I think we've got time for another question. Okay. Um, maybe you can address this briefly. It's, well, sort of, it, well, it goes along the lines of this. It's anonymous. I don't know where it's coming from, but this person writes, Last week, my daughter, who is in her 20s, informed me that she is transgender. My heart is broken. I've been reading everything I can to try and understand what is going on. I turn to my faith for comfort, but it seems that the Christian perspective on the subject of transgenderism is even more judgmental and unloving than anyone else's. Do you have any counsel for how I, as a Christian parent, can act in this situation? Hmm. Well, what you do as a Christian parent is what every Christian should be doing. You love your child, accept your child, and leave the judging to Yah. And that's it. That's it. Just like we said with the last question, it's been thousands of years since the human race has had access to the tree of life. Birth defects are going to occur. For example, take babies born into sex, what we used to call a hermaphrodite. Did you know that if we take into account all the different forms this birth defect takes, that's 1 in 1,500 to 1 in 2,000 babies that are born into sex. They're born that way. Statistics suggest that 4% of the world's population may be intersex in some way. Yeah, but that's, that's intersex, isn't it? That's different from someone deciding he or she is transgender. Or is it? On October the 25th, 2016, an article was published on Harvard University's website that referred to a number of different studies done that seemed to show a biological difference between transgender people and people whose biology was in agreement with their gender identity or cisgendered people. Two different studies showed that brain scans of transgender individuals were similar to the straight individuals of the sex with which they identified rather than their biological bodies. Now, my point is, we're here at the end of time. With all of the additives and preservatives in food, the extra hormones released from plastics, etc., 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 we shouldn't be surprised that our bodies, formed in the image of Yah, are failing this doesn't mean that a person is lost. It doesn't mean that Yah doesn't love them. He does. And that's what we're supposed to do. Love them and leave the judging to Yah. It's the basic principle of Matthew 22, isn't it? Yahushua said to him, You shall love Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen to that. Mm. Well, that's all the time we have today. If you've got a question or comment, please send us a message. Please go to worldslastchance.com and click contact us. It's quick and it's easy. And we really enjoy getting your messages. This is Jane Lamb with your daily promise from Yah's Word. It's never fun to go through unexpected trials, but these difficulties, stressful as they may be, are usually our greatest faith-building opportunities. It was by going through one such ordeal that the Chu family discovered there is power in the divine name. Aaron was Chu's 15-year-old son. One spring day, he got permission to visit a friend, hopped on his moped and set off. Not far from his home, a large van travelling in front of Aaron stopped at the entrance to a public garden, waiting to turn. Aaron didn't see that the van had stopped and ploughed full speed into the back of the van. He broke both legs in the accident, but worst of all, suffered severe head trauma. Bystanders called an ambulance which rushed him to the hospital, where he was immediately taken into emergency surgery. When Aaron's family finally learned of his accident and rushed to the hospital, they found their son battling for life in the intensive care unit. The neurosurgeon on his case bluntly informed them that the survival rate for Aaron's type of injury was only 50%. Furthermore, even if Aaron did survive, 
the head trauma was too great to expect him to regain full cognitive function. Aaron's injuries were extensive and he had lost a lot of blood. For five days he lay in the intensive care unit, unconscious. But, as Mrs Chu recalled, prayer isn't something we do on our own. Family and close friends gathered close. They called on the name of Yahua Rofi, Yah who heals, to save Aaron's life and restore him to health. It was a time of unremitting stress. Even minor setbacks became major obstacles when a body is so badly injured. One day, Mrs Chu withdrew to a quiet corner by herself. She had been praying that Yah would heal her son. Now she surrendered Aaron's life entirely to the father. She had dedicated her son to him before, but now she fully submitted to Yah's will, whatever it might be, regarding Aaron's life. Aaron spent a week and a half in ICU and a full month in the hospital. It took months of recovery and physical therapy, but the teen made a full recovery. At his final doctor's appointment, Aaron's doctor told his mum, It wasn't medicine that healed your son. She knew that already. It was Yahua Rofi, Yah who heals, that had fully restored her son's health. Jeremiah 30 verse 17 says, For I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith Yahweh. We've been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. have to say this has been a really interesting take on fear I'd never really thought of it as a a gift intended to reveal our hidden hearts but I can really see that right now Mm. and one response to fear leads to compromise with sin and unless the person repents being lost the other response to fear leads to increased confidence in the father and his love which increases our own love and gratitude which makes our faith still greater This understanding also explains a verse in Revelation that used to really bother me. Revelation chapter 22, verse 15. Can you just read that finally for us? Um, Let's read it in context, actually. Could you read Revelation 22, verses 14 and 15? Here the reward awaiting the different responses to fear is presented. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. Those whose fear response drove them to seek Yah's face, who used it as a reminder of all the times Yah had delivered his children in the past, those who let these reminders inspire their faith are the same ones who will stay faithful to Yah regardless of the cost. When the mark of the beast is being enforced, they're going to remember the three worthies facing down an angry king for refusing to worship his golden image. And like the three worthies, their answer will be, Our Eloha is able to deliver us, and even if he chooses not to, we still won't bow down and worship the image you've set up. I can really see that, actually, and the opposite holds true, too. Those whose response to fear has always been to compromise and give in, will keep doing it when the mark of the beast is being enforced. They're cowardly. They're too afraid to trust Yah, so they give in and are lost. Yes, this fear is a conjugation of the same Greek word we talked about earlier that connotates cowardice. Remember 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7? Mm. Yah hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. What an incredible difference from those who let their fear draw them close to Yah. 
Then as they experience for themselves his deliverance, their gratitude overflows, their love increases, and their faith strengthens. They're not afraid anymore. When they're told that they'll be executed if they refuse the mark of the beast, they'll have the same confidence Paul had when he said, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. That is the confidence all the redeemed will have. They'll trust Yah because they love him, and they love him because they know him. I'd like to close today with a final verse. It's found in 1 John chapter 4, verses 17 to 19. And I've got it here on the screen, and it says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. I just want to make an appeal to everyone listening. We don't have a lot of time left, but we do have enough time for you to get to know the Father for yourself. Make it a habit to spend time with him every morning. Meditate on the promises throughout the day. To know him is to love him. So get to know him. You'll have the confidence to face the days ahead because your confidence won't be in yourself. It will be in him who loves you. Join us again tomorrow. And until then, remember, Yahweh loves you and he is safe to trust. Are you facing a situation where you need divine help and guidance? There is power in prayer. Yahweh is just longing to answer the prayer of faith. If you would like others to join with you in prayer, visit our website and click on Prayer Requests. The WLC team prays over the prayer list each day and others around the world can join with you in seeking the Father's face. Remember, prayer moves the arm of omnipotence. Let us join you in prayer at worldslastchance.com. Thank you for listening to this episode on WLC Radio. We're living in very solemn times. The world is hovering on the brink of disaster. Catastrophic events will soon take place that will bring this age to a close and usher in the next. In his great mercy, Yahuwah has revealed through prophecy what the future holds. Revelation 8 foretells a series of events, each one worse than the last, that will devastate the earth. The world's food supplies will be decimated. Famine and its accompanying pestilence will result. The Earth's fresh water supplies will also be affected. Revelation 9 reveals that demons will impersonate extraterrestrials. The terror and devastation of this so-called alien invasion will make people desperate for safety at any cost. The freedom to live and worship as the conscience dictates will become a thing of the past. Many lives will be lost during this series of events, and when the mark of the beast is enforced, there will be martyrs. Each event prepares for the next crisis. In one long last call of mercy to repent, for Yahuwah is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Shortly following the events described in Revelation 8 and 9, the seven last plagues will be poured out. These plagues and the earlier trumpets will wreak havoc on the earth and cause unprecedented destruction and misery. Isaiah 24 warns, quote, Behold, Yahuwah maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, 
and it shall fall and not rise again. Unquote. For believers, however, there is hope. In describing the end of this age, Yahushua said in Luke 21 verse 28, quote, When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Unquote. Yes, the end will be traumatic. It's meant to be. Yahuwah wants to save every individual he can, so he allows this final climax to awaken souls. But the gospel of the kingdom of Yah is that, beyond the traumatic events of the near future, an eternity of bliss awaits all who accept Yah's gift of salvation. When Yahushua returns, all who've died trusting in the merits of the crucified and risen Savior will be raised back to life in the first resurrection. Yahushua will then set up Yah's kingdom on earth. He and the redeemed will reign jointly on the earth for the first thousand years of eternity. John saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. If you wish to join with the redeemed of all ages, living a life that measures with the life of Yahuwah, make the choice. Accept salvation today. You don't have to get yourself ready. The truth is, you can't. Neither can I. No one can. Come to Him just as you are. Don't wait until you've quit sinning. You're not going to get better through your own efforts. Accept Yahuwah's invitation to become a member of His eternal earthly kingdom. When you accept this precious invitation, Yahuwah will gift you with a brand new heart. In Ezekiel 36, verse 26, he declares, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Accepting this priceless gift is the only way for joining his kingdom. Come to Yahuwah just as you are. He's waiting with arms wide open eager to receive all who come to him. You have been listening to WLC Radio. This program, as well as past episodes of Radio WLC, are available for downloading on our website. These are great for sharing with friends and Bible studies. It is also a wonderful resource for those worshipping Yahuwah alone or at home. If you would like to listen to Radio WLC programmes, visit our website at worldslastchance.com. Click on the Radio WLC icon at the top right of the homepage. This will allow you to download the episodes in your preferred language. There are also articles and videos available in a variety of languages. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 93.30 kHz on the 31-metre band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return.